Hello, I'm Alice Major, and I'm delighted to be here with, as part of the Art Bar reading series. Um, this is the series' 30th year, and it's been quite an achievement by so many people to pull this off. And I'm glad to have this opportunity to uh, read three poems for you. They're all from my book, Welcome to the Anthropocene. And um, they share a common metaphorical approach from mathematics. So when I'm trying to write a poem about a deeply personal subject, I'll often be looking for a way to shape it so that it doesn't become a blurt on the page. And I've found that math can often help me that way. It can help maybe provide a, a form uh, or shape for the poem. And it can also um, give me a source of metaphor. It gives me a, a kind of breathing space around the content. So the first poem is called Catena. That's a word from Latin, and it means chain. And it's also the root of the word catenary. Now, catenary curves are, are very common in our world. Uh, you see them everywhere. Think of a, um, a power line sort of sagging between two poles, that curve, or the drape of a line of spider web. Um, mathematically, this family of curves is built from a particular constant, the number e. Now, e is an irrational number. It's like pi. It, its decimal expansion goes on forever. Um, and it's the base of natural logarithms. So it's, it's a number that's intrinsic to calculations like compound interest or population growth. And it's also fundamental to the equations that generate catenary curves. So I've been looking for a way to deal with the particular subject, the, the deaths recently of two family members, both of whom had to live with the effects of congenital illness that had irrevocably shaped their lives. My niece had died at the age of 40 from uh, a, a form of muscular dystrophy that constantly curtailed her physical life. My brother-in-law had died in his late 60s after living with schizophrenia since his early teens. And I wanted to express something of the burden this had been for both of them, the hardship it had meant for them and their families, and also the arbitrariness of the luck that had done this, and the the also the continuity and discontinuities that resulted from genetic malfunction. Anyway, I was able to put this content together with the idea of E. Um, so it gave me a shape. Uh, the number of lines in each stanza are uh, determined by the next digit in the decimal expansion of E. Now, you won't hear that so much when I read it, but you can... Uh, you can perhaps hear a little bit because I've used uh, rhyme as a kind of way of signaling coming to the end of one stanza and the beginning of the next. Um, and also it gave me that metaphorical pattern using the curve. Um, so here we are, Katena. Two point seven one eight two eight, and so on. Two, crapshoot, snake eyes, the double twine of chromosome supercoiled, coils on coils. Point, nitpick of gene. And then the downward plunge, the ravine that splits a life away from fair beginnings. Catenary curve. Line of a rope bridge slung above a chasm, sickening sway at its lowest point, suspended tension, the chain of accident, curvilinear, that shapes a life. Each life so 
wholly singular. Inimitable outcome of equations, universal patterns driving the particular. Your brothers bend above you in farewell. The summer twilight fades to the murmured Kaddish. Your graven face lays pale as feldspar. Three brothers, chains of DNA, so sibling similar and yet unique. And the long chain binding you to breath, now broken. Why do bad things happen to biodiverse people? the random chosen. Catenary, the dark arc mapping the path of grief, its exponential plunge from, no, this is not happening, to the comprehended, it is. The slowing increments of loss, when it can't get any worse or any better. The sad slog up to stand on something that approaches solid ground. The curve by which decay and growth are bound, each to the other. The hand-me-down of inheritance, three brothers, three sets of paired DNA, two to the power of three, but for you a twist, untwist, unraveling skein that let the voices in, distracting companionship, private and persistent, that stuck with you, splitting your brain's reality into the inner more convincing. Some of your voices were kind and made us smile. Lawrence Welk inviting you to sing for him in Mendocino, California, and you sang for the nurses, Welcome to my world. But other voices were distressing, made disjunctive, angry claims on your attention, strains sung in a darker key. In response, you clung to a smattering of memories, like knots in the bridge's rope, boyhood's triumphs and hopeful trophies, the praise that made you proud. Your prayer shawl is wrapped around your shroud. It is freshly ironed, and the knotted fringes lie smooth, blue threads of memory that wind through a life. Your face now closed over the missing mystery. Of mind. Prevalence of schizophrenia, nine in a thousand. Incidence of syndrome X at age Y. Such calculations scatter data onto graphs. Discrete points freckling, filling out a range, shading in the shape of populations. But who experiences life that way? Each point merely plots a cross-section of the line that runs from birth to end. Ovum. Start again. Chromosome 4. A minuend snapped shorter by subtraction of base pairs, and a girl's body withers decade by decade, fiber by muscle fiber. Now we place a spray of flowers beside her, cerise and purple bougainvillea, and a stuffed pink toy. Her breathing mask can now be laid aside, and lilac silk softens the harsh arc from scapula to hip. Catenary, traced by gravity's fingertips, the curve of substance hanging by its own weight. Curl, coil, turn, fortune's wheel, dame fate, lady luck. She does not toss the unlinked chance of dice. No, she maps consequences of 
initial conditions. The dystrophy, invisible at first, its continuance a tightening cord that pulled her backbone into a bow, winched her hips, locked her into wheelchair. Disease confined her body, but never touched her mind. Her glad passions, her love of purple, the lines she drew and wrote. How she loved Paris, the idea of it, of flower markets with their notes of violet and lavender, the style of streets, romance of arrondissement, the curvature of Eiffel Tower dressed in the twinkling cloth of twilight. Zero, the round nothing, placeholder, rest. The awful intimacy chained to the failing body, its excrements and mess. The strain of lowering a coffin into earth, laboring to restrain its drop. How we hung on so long to our end of the rope the dead weight of bad luck getting worse until its ending, the breaking ache, the tipping box laden with what we have to love. And the exhausted ones, the anchor standing closest to the edge, feet braced against the pool, the compound growth of care, its relentless decimal expansion, another journey to emergency, another jolt of hope, syringe of fear, another impossible decision. Is it not time to hand fate back her shears, the blades we've tried so hard to keep from her, binding their edges in a web of surgical gauze, research, medicines? And yet your brother murmurs in his dreams. I never thought I'd see my brother's face like that. I never thought I'd see him dead. I never wanted him to die. Catenary, it's the curve of memory. Her dreams of reaching Paris, their songs, la vie en rose, welcome to our world. Each life a single digit that belongs to the continuing. Catena, from the Latin chain. The bonds of stressed metal. The line necklace, shiny. Catenary, bow of acceptance finding its path across the gorge. Spider silk in glinting wind the swing of phone lines swayed with frost, the messages we send, adieu, adieu. Two dead faces, a number that goes on forever. Why you? Why you? The second poem is called Zero Divided by Zero. You can ask Siri what uh, Zero Divided by Zero is and you get a somewhat amusing answer. But it was quite a serious question for mathematicians. If you follow one line of logic, the answer is one. You know, five over five is one and four over four is one and one half over one half is one, and so zero over zero should logically be one. However, an, another chain of logic says the answer should be zero, because three over zero equals zero, and two over zero equals zero, and one over zero equals zero, so zero over zero equals zero. You end up with a paradox. Uh, a logical impasse where both answers seem right 
and inevitable. There is no right answer. The trains of logic crash, annihilate certainty. Zero is just as good an answer as one. Nothingness or loneliness. There is no right answer. The woman, God Oliva, books the hour to annihilate herself. An Antwerp euthanasia clinic. A life too long, a brain too hurt. Nothing is her answer. The pastor sets himself on fire in a Texas parking lot, annihilated by grief for a world that cannot learn kindness. He's tried everything else, finds no other answer. Mental illness. That's one label for the call to self-annihilation. But is martyrdom, immolation, never the sanest path, the kindest thing? There is no right answer. Zero divided by zero. The past's black hole annihilated, divided by the null of future. Suicide's paradox. Relief unfelt by those who choose its answer. Black holes are where God divides by zero. Annihilated light, all our singular arrangements of matter reduced to one undefinable answer. My sister holds a vial of danger, matter that could annihilate her, but, divided into increments, will let her sleep, let her breathe. But there is no answer for the anguish that strangles her, for the losses that seem to annihilate her past, divide her from a future worth living. The vial's round mouth seems an answer. Saint God Oliva, Centuries ago, you were annihilated, strangled by the servants of a cruel husband. Pray for us now that we find an answer. Your name means God's love. But God seems zero over zero, nil, a void divided by a vacuum. How could being, oneness, ever emerge as answer. How can we live here, Godaliva, in this universe where pain annihilates sometimes all joy? The thought flares, would it be easier to let her go? Then the answer, no, my sister, oh my sister, you terrify me. If you annihilate this pain, then you divide us Utterly, you cannot be both zero and one. There is no right answer. So, the third poem, finally, I'd like to read, is called Complex Number Plane. And once again, I'd better give you some math context. I... I I feel I should apologize for turning a poetry reading into a math lesson, but I do find the ideas of mathematics um, resonate with so many things for me, which is maybe not surprising because the patterns of math are originally derived from the natural world and help us to explore its patterns. Anyway, complex number plane also draws on something that puzzled mathematicians for centuries. And the question is, what is the square root of minus 1? Okay, you have the number line, and it's stretching out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way in, to, in the positive direction, and minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and all. 
down to the negatives and and um, all the fractions and decimals and and square roots of other numbers are located on on that line but what number could you possibly um, come up with multiply by itself to come up with minus one it is nowhere on that line and yet the square root of minus one kept turning up in equations as the answer and finally mathematicians gave it a name they called it I for imaginary but they actually found in the last century that they could use the concept to build a whole other plane of numbers, the complex number plane, beyond that singular line. So I suppose in, in some ways this poem is also about how we have to update our historical um, constructions and how difficult that can sometimes be, even when we mean well. An envelope opens. Your photograph falls to the flat plane of the floor. Your male face bisected by slashing sunlight. Lovers once, X crossed, so fraught a transit through complexity, so short a time, we fought about how, hang, how high to hang the pictures. Though our quarrels were, in truth, at root, confused equations of love and difference. You were so different. The men across the subway car stared from me to you, our clasped hands, your hair crinkling to your shoulders, your sockless ankles, the giant hoops that hung from your earlobes, round as zeros, in those days when one earring on a man signaled a known code. And one starer asked the other, what do two earrings mean? I did not mean you harm, and yet I harmed. Then laughed years later when I heard you'd gone through knife and needle to change your gender. How did I miss that? I asked, remembering your dark, stubbled jaw, the thrust of bulk, face and chest, your obvious cough. I missed so much. The sheer ignorance of those dumb years stuns me now. My young life lived on such a narrow line, just one dimension, where positive digits ranged always to the right, masculine and shining, their mirror yin, the dark and feminine negative spreading to the infinite left, and at the center, uncrossable zero definer of difference. What do two earrings mean? I had no idea then that zero also doubles as the round center of a second axis, perpendicular extent, of numbers multiplied by I square root of minus one, a quantity mathematicians termed imaginary through puzzled centuries. Impossible, but falling out of ordinary calculations, refusing to disappear. Proved newly useful at last, constructing a vertical spine to open an expanded plane of possibility. What do two earrings mean? Boys who want to wear a Cinderella dress, the hermaphrodite folding a single body around two genders, women whose upper lips grow dark with hair, those inheriting heterochromosomes that don't line up, 
I had no idea how my limited arithmetic clamped a lid on complex planes. We were stymied by our times, by what could not be thought in the world where we grew up. Your father's horror at the sun in a sparkly dress. It was a world of new techniques deployed in old ways. Surgical invention used only to assign confusing newborns to the right side of a narrow number line. Chemistry applied to the straightening of disorienting orientations. You stood at a verge where wider understanding could start to trail discovery's slow curve. But it's hard to be the first. What could two earrings mean? I wonder now, was it really needed, the surgery, the blasts of anti-androgen, that drastic subtraction? Did you have to be only woman? Could you not have kept that cock, reimagining yourself as one plus one I, and gone on loving the women in yourself? Did you just need to cut a male face from your life, that horrified father? Or was it indeed a horror of dysphoria you had to escape? entrapment in a body that was not you, and so you mapped yourself as minus one plus one I, even as you went on loving women and never wanted men. It saddens me to know I'll never know the answer, now buried below history and beyond reconstruction. I feel a kind of shame. Not that I failed to love you. Hearts map their own complicated planes and stubborn coordinates. But I regret that laugh. It did not rise from malice, just a blurt of surprise, and yet it was mindlessly unkind, evidence of all I did not see while insisting pictures must line up at the level of my eye. You could have been an alternative axis of vision. Forgive me for living in my time, accepting its blinkered limits. Forgive me that I failed to see your complex face. Thank you so much for sharing this time for, with me and uh, thank you again to the Art Bar. Uh, so many different voices over the years. Good night.